everyone, and thanks for tuning in to the Path 11 podcast. This is your host, April Hanna. Now, today, we actually don't have a show, but what we are bringing to you is the Q&A panel that we had with Tom Campbell and Mark Serto at the Unity North Atlanta Church when we did our screening of the Path Evolution. Uh, we had a great time being back at the Unity North Church, and I know some of you have already listened to the interview with Reverend Richard, which was really great, too, but uh, we decided that we had the capability of plugging in and recording the Q&A, and we have about an hour and 15 minutes of questions and answers that were asked on behalf of Tom and Mark both answering them, and we think that you guys are really going to enjoy this. Um, We know we've gotten a great response from the Q&A podcast that we put out from the Monroe Institute. So it seems like that each Q&A that we do, there's different questions that are asked and a lot of, um, you know, just more content that Tom, at least in this Q&A, because he was down there for Atlanta, is able to kind of go over in, in some of his teachings. And I think that uh, you guys are, will also be really interested in learning more about Mark Serto, who was also somebody who worked at the Monroe Institute as one of Bob Monroe's sound engineers. So he had a uh, a little bit to say there. And also just to let you know that the overall quality of our Q&A panels when we put them out for the podcast aren't going to be of the highest quality because we are kind of tapping into other people's sound systems. You might hear a little bit of a hum in the background here. And uh, we were kind of joking around Tom when he starts talking, he kind of forgets to hold the microphone up to his mouth and he's kind of using the microphone as a prop and, you know, with his hand gestures. So his audio is a little bit lower, but just crank it up um, on your phone or on your speaker and um, just forgive us on, on that behalf. But we hope you enjoy this. First of all, my compliment. Thank you very much. Um, my question is directed to you. You mentioned in one of your uh, segments that you had out-of-body experience at the age of five or six, very young. Can you define that for me a bit um, Give me examples what that process felt and how did you reach your conclusion that this is an evolving process and it will go on with your life, if that's okay. There's several parts to that, several parts to that question. Uh, yes, I was, um, I don't know exactly, but just five, six, seven, somewhere in that, probably more than five, less than seven. So six is a good number. And entities entities uh, came by, and basically I found myself wide awake outside of my body. Still in my room, same bedroom, whatever, but just existing, awake. I could look around, I could see everything that was there. Um, and I wasn't in my body, and I could see my body lying in the bed. And I thought, neat. This is really neat. And then an entity talked to me and said, well, you know, you can move. You don't just have to be still there. You can move with your intent. Just think moving out through the window, out to the yard. And it's like, can I do that? Okay. So I did. And right through the wall I went. And when I got to the wall, it was like one of those, you know. I expected a crash, but I just went right through it. And there I was out in the yard. And I spent the next, I don't know, what seemed like an hour or so, playing with that. Just going places, so moving through the hedge, you know, through the neighbor's yard, you know, through trees. And just like a kid would, I was just having fun, just playing with that ability to move my awareness around. But the world was still very much the way it was when... I was awake. You know, it was still the same house, the same trees, the same hedge, all of that was there. And then the next night, something like that happened again and again and again. And then eventually I became very conversant with these entities that were talking to me and giving me instructions and telling me what I could do. And, you know, the, the, uh, the, the experiences I could have. So we became friends, if you will. And from then on ensued a series of classes where I was taught how to do this myself because I just went to sleep and then I woke. I was in my room. It wasn't a process that I was controlling. So they taught me techniques to to do this on my own so I could do it whenever I wanted to. And eventually they 
they talked about. At first, they didn't want to teach me. At first, they thought that it would be better that I didn't know how to do that by myself because then I'd be a little out of their control. They wanted me a little more under their control so they could work with me for a while yet before they set me loose. But eventually, they did set me loose. And then, it wasn't me exploring and going through walls and hedges. It was me learning how to control the, now I'll use energy as a metaphor, the energy that I seem to be able to control, the intent. And under all sorts of circumstances. And what are the right answers to these questions? You know, how do you react to these situations? How do you use your intent to modify these situations? So I did that then for a few years. Basically, I was in class every night. And uh, so that's what I meant by I started very young. So I was just taught how to get around, how to interact, you know, what to do, what not to do, what to be careful of, all those kinds of things that you need to know to become at home and, and useful in the non-physical. Okay, so that's what happened. Now, is any of that necessary for you to evolve the quality of your consciousness? No, it is not. You don't have to go out of body or do anything paranormal to grow up and become love. That just has to do with getting rid of fear. Now, that happened to me because it was on my path. It was part of what I needed to do. I couldn't be here now talking to you after having written three books about the nature of reality if I wasn't able to explore reality. So that was part of what I had to do. And that was part of my training to help me to be able to do that. But it's not necessary to grow up and evolve. It just happened to be on my path. So it's, none of those things are important. What's important is getting rid of the fear and becoming love. Getting rid of the ego, getting rid of the beliefs. That is important. This was just my path. It doesn't have to be anybody else's path. So yes, the out-of-body experience uh, was mine from very young. And then, after I was more like, you know, what, nine, ten, in that age, the door was shut because they did not want me to grow up strange, a misfit, not able to connect with other people in this reality because that wouldn't have been healthy for me either. So there was some point where I was told, this is your last time, no more. And then when I was in my 20s, I ran into Bob Monroe, started working there, and as I got to maybe six or seven months into that, all these numbers came back. All the things that had happened and all the details of it, and then it was like one continuous thing. Where I stopped at age 10, I started up again at age 23, 25, something like that. You know, more like 26, especially by 20. So I just started up again, and the explorations just pick back up, but I already had all the skills that I had developed earlier. So it was a quick study. I was prepared to do it. So that's sort of how that worked out. And and then uh, a curious thing happened is Bob Monroe and I were talking one in, uh, evening, and he was telling me about a series of, we call them tests, things that we needed to react to and how we react to it. And they certainly felt like tests. And he was telling me about a series of these that he had just recently experienced the night before. And I'd already had that series back when I was seven, six. I'd done that series of tests before, so I recognized him. And right in the middle of him telling me those, he said, well, here's the first one, and here's the second one. And it all came back. And I said, wait a minute. Let me collect. I collected all these thoughts together as they poured back in. And I said, the third one was this. And then the fourth one was that. His jaw dropped like, how did you know that? He said, I've taken that test. So some of these tests are standardized. <laughs> They're standardized tests. Well, you got something that works, you use it. So then it all started to work together and came back together. So does that answer your question? This question is for Mark. Mark, you worked 
alongside Bob Monroe for many years, like Tom did. What was your most life-changing experience working with him? There are a lot to choose from. I would have to say the experience of just knowing this man as my friend was life-changing enough. His experiences, his knowledge, his wisdom, his sense of humor, he was always willing to share very openly with me. And we had a lot of intimate moments. He never presented anything to me as absolute gospel. When I would ask him questions, he would say, from my experiences, thus and such, but go to Focus 15 and take a left. Go find out for yourself. Bob created this system of consciousness in terms of focus level, which is kind of a, a map of a very large territory that we call consciousness. But he, he, wasn't, he was my teacher in so many ways by not teaching. He taught by example, simply because of the quality of his heart. He encouraged me to be curious. That's one of the things I admired about him most, was that he was never satisfied with a given answer. For instance, Tom spoke a bit about how the out-of-body experience can be a helpful part of one's particular path in growing and learning, but it's not the only path. He never proselytized to me or to anybody else that I'd ever heard that it was important to have this experience. He never said to me, uh, unless you have a particular series of experiences or pass the tests that Tom was talking about, that you wouldn't grow. His basic message to me was, be as curious as you possibly can be, and it'll all kind of reveal itself. So, any one experience with him would be to diminish the whole, which is why I told you more about the quality of the man. The experience of being with him in the way that we were together was the best experience. Is that clear enough? So that's it. The secrets of the universe are revealed. We can all go to home then. Got short. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to say thank you to all four of you. Um, all three tapes or DVDs in the series are just awesome. <laughs> I've really enjoyed all of them, so I appreciate it. Um, there was a question that I knew I had from the second DVD a couple of years ago, and for the life of me, I couldn't remember it. I had a long drive getting here today, and I kept thinking, oh, it was something I wanted to ask you, Tom, and you said it again tonight in this one, so thank you very much, and that is the simple statement, which you just say very nonchalantly, that consciousness is digital. Now, I understand you saying it's data, but I also see consciousness as being something beyond our capacity of understanding. And to hear you say it's digital makes it sound quantifiable. And to me, that's like that's more a perception of it being digital. Or can you take me further than that in making that statement? Sure. The model of consciousness that, that I have is consciousness as a digital information system. But I emphasize the word model. Okay. That's just a model of reality. And I say many times in my books and in my talks, don't confuse reality with the model of reality. Okay. Consciousness as a digital information system is a metaphor, not a fact. It's the way of talking about consciousness. You see, we need, we need to be able to create context in which we can have discussions. So we need models to help us do that. And I noticed in the, in the film, there was lots of models that kept showing up. We saw, uh, you know, there was some uh, new age models, you know, higher frequencies, uh, you know, the earth is shrugging off its stuff, you know, that kind of stuff. Well, those are new age models. And it's not a, me a matter as, well, is the model right or wrong? It's not the point. They're metaphors. They're ways of expressing ideas. And you don't really, or you shouldn't really get too much wrapped around the language 
of the metaphor, but rather look at what the metaphor is trying to communicate. So the reason I ended up with a digital model is because reality is information. All of our senses do nothing other than collect information, whether it's light, it makes an electrical signal on the retina, or whether it's nerve endings that get compressed by a touch, or you know the the uh, waves that are first fluid waves, first air waves, then fluid waves in the ear, and then more electrical signals in the nervous system. It's all just information, you see. So what we're aware of, what we're conscious of, consciousness, awareness, is information, communication. That's what consciousness does. It communicates. It feels. It cares. You know, it interacts. That's all information. So when we talk about information, then, well, what's the simplest form of information? A bit. Information can't get any simpler than a bit. I see, I'm a physicist. You see, I kind of talk science speak. So this is the way I see the world. So information, smallest part's a bit. And bits are discrete. That means it's not a continuous thing. It's a discrete thing. So is our information. So are those little electrical impulses. They're all discrete things. So are the photons that energize the retina that make those little pulses. All of that information, as you look at the science of it, all the neurons. It's all discrete pieces. So information can best be described. In other words, the best metaphor for information is a digital metaphor, one of bits. And that's all there is to it. It's just a metaphor for creating a model which allows us to talk about something. And it's the same with the larger consciousness system. It's a metaphor. Um, individuated units of consciousness, you know, some of my, my metaphors that, that I use, well, you might call that a soul or whatever, but again, it's another metaphor. Higher self is a metaphor. Chakras are metaphors. The only thing that's fundamental is consciousness. Everything else are descriptions, metaphors. There is no thing. That's really a chocolate. That's a way of us making metaphors so we can rearrange the data and think constructively about the various kinds of spiritual connections that we have. Spiritual energy. Energy's a metaphor. Light is a metaphor. The only thing that's real is consciousness. You see? So that's, that's kind of the, the spectrum. And people do tend to take these models too seriously. They, they make kind of physical things out of the models, and it's just, it has to be just like that. And then they start taking the metaphors and breaking the metaphors into pieces, and pretty soon you run out of the metaphor's capacity to make sense, is what happens. All right, who, you know, here's a higher self. Well, you know, what are the parts of a higher self? Let's break that apart into pieces. And then what are those pieces broke? Pretty soon you, you lose, you know, you lose the meaning in the first place. So they're not really meant to be broken apart into too many pieces. These are high-level metaphors that just help us talk about these issues in a meaningful way. And in the 2000s that we live in now, metaphors about computers and data and information and digital systems and virtual realities all make a whole lot of sense to a lot of people. Because that's what our life is made of, of, these kinds of things. So we can see that in terms of those sorts of things. We go back a 100 years and none of those words were available. None of those concepts were available. So they talked about souls and ghosts and other kinds of things. It was different metaphors or vibrations or other sorts of things. And those were the metaphors. So it's, it's a kind of a, a newer way of talking about it. But one of the neat things is that once you see it as an information system, you realize that, that using that metaphor allows you to understand a whole lot more of it in a scientific way. So now you're using kind of scientific technology, you know, words and concepts. And suddenly, 
you know, you can actually derive things like quantum mechanics and relativity from a model of consciousness, which you can't do when there are vibrations and souls and things. You're, you're missing that connection. You're missing the dialogue that can lead you into science. So that's the reason for it. There are, you know, there's only one truth, but there are thousands and thousands of ways to express that truth that are useful. And all of them are different kinds of metaphors and different kinds of tools. But this is just one that uh, kind of works better for me. I'm a physicist, so what else, what else would it be? You know? What I did in my career was I made computer models of physical reality. Okay? That was that was what I did. So uh, that's how it ends up in my in my metaphors. But they do have an ability then to translate these ideas into more technical concepts. So that's a big thing where metaphysics derives physics, and we see that you don't have the metaphysics on this side and the science. The physics on the other side with some kind of a wall between them, and each one kind of calling the other one incomplete and silly. You know, that's not really the way it is. It's all one thing. And you can see how it all belongs together. It all comes out of the same root understanding of the nature of reality. So, more update metaphors. That's really, That's really all you got. All right. My question's for April and Mike. And I heard the story for the first time in Boston. It was such a fun story. I want to hear it again. <laughs> Explain the name Path 11. Okay, um, so Path 11 came to be when we met and we started working on the film that we would continue to catch 111 or 1111 on the clock. And then as we discussed a little bit more and we researched a little bit what's this 1111 phenomenon, um, trying to figure it out, we then went and spoke to somebody about numerology and figured out what our life path numbers were. And Mike's an 11, and I'm a 9. And we were like, oh, there's the 11 again. And I was like, well, I was born at 111. And then now we start investigating, and I'm like, oh, my God, we live 11 miles apart. <laughs> um, and so this whole thing with, you know, 11 popped up. And then when we were on the road to go and meet all these people, we stopped at Donna and Keith's house of MBT events. And at the time, I had a really old Nokia cell phone, if anybody remembers that. And you had to press kind of hard on the buttons. And I have a picture of this on our Facebook page because I was blown away. And uh, I didn't take the cell phone in, and I remember locking it. You had to press the star and then something else on the bottom, and it got shoved in the car or the driver's seat um, console there. So we came out, and I go to pick up my phone to check it, and all of a sudden there's 11 ones on the cell phone, and I freaked out. I'm like, oh my God, Mike, look at this. Um, nobody's gonna believe me, I gotta take a picture of this. And I didn't know what the heck was going on or what it meant, but we kept saying, well, maybe that means we're on the right path. And so part of calling this Path 11 was trying to figure out how do we let people know that this is a path, that this is a journey, not only for us, but for everyone. And then the 11 was really significant and continues to be significant. Sometimes we'll post pictures on in our Instagram page when we were filming everybody in 2015 and twice we put it in the GPS where we're going. Estimated arrival time, 11.11. 1 11 p.m. I'm like, there it is. Take a picture of it. Nobody's going to believe it. <laughs> so um, those were most of the stories. Am I forgetting any? No. So that continues to, to happen. And somebody had asked in Massachusetts uh, to Tom, like, well, what does that mean? And you said something like, well, it's just like another indication that you're in this digital reality. Yeah, one of the council system is having a little fun with you. <laughs> Get you focused. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and by the way, the path after life, we cut stuff out, the running time, an hour and 11 minutes. <laughs> Not planned. <laughs> I was going to say, I have a friend, she believes 333, and she has a story behind it, and then she called it Angels. And I was, I knew about 1111, and I said 1111, and she said, yes, but it's 
everybody has different path. I'm sure the path start 11-11 for some people. They believe and conscious believe, and they follow and they get a result. But for her, it was 333, and it was just unbelievable. My phone uh, has 333, three, 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 and she shakes hand with me and says, you got a deal. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, it was pretty cool, too. When we were making this film, I was in my office and had my phone on Do Not Disturb, and after a client had left, I went and checked it and said, missed call from 1111111. I screenshotted it, and I said, and I looked it up. I Googled it to see, does this happen on iPhones? Like, is this a random number that calls or something like that? And I couldn't find anything on it, so that's so how it keeps happening. But. Good evening. This has been my first exposure to your work, and I find it really fascinating, so thank you again. I just wanted to invite additional comment on a point. It sounds like you know, that you're saying that the pace of evolution is really accelerating and it almost like that we should expect to vibrate, vibrate beyond this level in the next 10 or 20 years or so. And yet when we look around, things don't seem to be advancing <laughs> from many perspectives. So I just wanted to invite you to talk a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah, when you look around and you get a newspaper or watch the news, you can be convinced that, uh, you know, this is one of the worst places that ever could possibly exist. All you see is death and destruction and, and fear and guilt, you know, greed and so on. It seems to be everywhere. That's true. But you've probably heard the expression Internet time, which was something that was coined oh, a couple of decades ago when the Internet was a, was a new thing. And that's the things happen more quickly now because information travels much more quickly now. And we are much more connected with all the other people, the other seven and a half billion of us. We're all much more connected than we used to be. It used to be people would, would be born, grown up, and die within 20, 30, 40 miles of the same place. You know, and they were very provincial. They didn't have a very big picture of reality or other people. It's a little hard to have empathy for other people when they're just, it's all intellectual. You know, you've never actually been there and seen them and talked with them. So things do move a lot quicker now. And now I don't necessarily think that within, you know, 10 or even 20 or 50 years, you know, we're all going to be sitting in circles, you know, singing songs of love. But we are moving in that direction, and the pace does quicken. It is accelerating. And I see that the thing that encourages me is I see that for the very first time in the history of the human race, we have an opportunity to take large steps forward. And the reason of that is, again, our connectedness, the Internet. There's always been what I call you know, bubbles of enlightenment show up for the last 2,500 years. You know, you'll find groups of people who have the big picture. They understood what was important. They knew love was the answer. They understood how reality worked. You know, it was illusion. You know, that's you know, 2,500 years ago. That's as close as you could get to saying virtual reality. <laughs> um, so you have these, and you have them now. You know, there'll be groups of people, or even individual people, who have grown up a lot, have a lot of understanding, but they've always been isolated, and they've always been in the margins. This little group, that little group, others, because they're outnumbered, and they easily get overwhelmed and swept away by more forceful currents of history. So they come, and they go, and they live in the margins. Well, we now have communications that we can take all those thousands of groups of enlightened people, and they can start to feel each other's energy. They can start to feel that connection toward it. That will grow. That will become a much more powerful force in our culture. It will help move it out of the margins because instead of being a thousand people here, ten people there, one person over there, it will be hundreds of thousands of people that say, you yeah, we need to move toward love. That's important. Well, now you've got to a force, if you will, who has to be reckoned with, a cultural force that needs to be reckoned with. And so that's one that's one part of it. Okay, there's a another part of it is that 
because we now can think in terms of virtual reality, and when I say that, everybody kind of has an idea what that means because either you've played virtual reality games or your children have or your grandchildren have, and you've seen it. And you see that they're getting better and better and more lifelike. So the idea that we're in a virtual reality is not such a strange and hard thing to grasp. We've got new virtual realities that are going to be released any day now that have quintillions of worlds in them, have universes bigger than our physical universe with numbers of planets. And every one of those quintillions of planets is full of fauna, critters that evolve, change in time. And the game is so big that there will probably, even if millions of people play it for hundreds of years, there will be planets undiscovered just in this virtual reality game. See? So the virtual reality is now starting to show us worlds that really look a lot like our world, function a lot like our world. And this was done by, you know, I'm 71, so I say four kids. This was done by four young people and just a little bit of computer power, like desktop computer power, laptop computer power, because they found cleverer ways to program or procedural programming. So, in any case, it's getting easier and easier to understand these concepts. When the Buddha said, you know, this is what we see in front of us, it's all man, it's all illusion. Well, that's poetry. Right? That's poetry. And we kind of get a sense or a feel for that. Yeah, sort of. But when you see it in terms of virtual reality, particularly when you have experience with it, now it starts to make sense. So I think we now have the tools, the vocabulary, the metaphors, that this will start to make more sense. Instead of just being poetry, it will be science. And you can take that virtual reality concepts and you can derive physics from it. I've got a set now of 12 quantum mechanics experiments that within a couple of months I'll have out on YouTube that will redefine quantum mechanics based on the concepts of virtual reality. And right now, quantum mechanics is a science that nobody understands why it works. They know the how. Well, I chug on this math, and I make these assumptions, and I chug on the math, I can get the right answer. Why these assumptions should be the way they are, you know, why is it like that? What does it mean? Not a clue. Well, you can take virtual reality concepts, and from those, you can derive exactly why quantum mechanics works, what it means, why it is that way. So instead of being weird science, it's just normal science. But you see it from a virtual reality perspective, you see. So these things could make big differences. If science, the, the, as I said in the video, science being the high priests of our culture, they kind of tell everybody else what's real and what's believable. Well, if they, in the next decade or two, see virtual reality as a, that's the way it is. And when I started this, published my books in 2002, as far as I knew, me and two other people in the world thought virtual reality was a really good idea. And now it's probably 20, 30% of the physics department in every major university on the planet. So it's grown that much. Why? It's better physics. It answers the experiments better than any other model. You see, we're moving that way. So we've got leverage. We've got an internet. We're going to bring all these people together who think love is a good thing, better than greed and, and fear. That obviously we need more of it. We've got the high priests who are moving in that direction. Let's see, virtual reality is the way to go. And the way that works out is that once the scientists say, well, virtual reality is the best model we have for reality, what's the next question? Who's the programmer, right? How does, how does virtual reality get made? Where does it come from? Because a virtual reality cannot make itself. It has to be made elsewhere. Or in Dr. Fredkin, one of the physicists, he was, he was one of the three, myself and you know, I said two other people with well, Dr. Fredkin's a well known physicist and you know, he calls that other. It has to come from other. Other means not part of this reality. It has to come from outside of this reality. 
Well, what is that? What does it mean? So suddenly we have physics starting to stir up a fire in metaphysics and philosophy. And how do we answer that? What is of it? Okay. Now, about this time, once the scientists do that, I expect some kind of a, a, a food fight to develop amongst religions, trying to say, you know, my God is other, my God's the programmer, you know, no, no, mine is, you know, well, let's have a war over that, you know, we'll, we'll have some of that, but hopefully, yeah, but hopefully we won't stay there very long. Hopefully we'll, we'll see the idea is that if it's virtual reality, it's information. If it's information, then it's an information system. Obviously, it's the system, right? It's the big thing, lots of parts. So it's an information system. Well, we know about information systems, right? We buy and sell information systems all the time. We, we've got a handle on that. So now it's a digital information system. Now, again, we're talking models and metaphors, but they're understandable, you see, to a large number of people. Not just poetry that nobody can really quite get their hands around. Things that you can really talk about. So when you get to that point, then the next step is to say that consciousness is information. The larger system, then, is consciousness. Consciousness is the computer. And once you understand that consciousness is a computer, it's one little logic step to realize that if you optimize consciousness interaction, conscious interaction, that's a social system. All these individuated units of consciousness with you and I and everybody else, you optimize that social system through cooperation, not through self-centeredness. Self-centeredness is high energy. It tears things apart. Cooperation helps build things, you see. Consciousness and in all information systems, scientists will already tell you that information systems contain entropy. The highest entropy information system is all random bits, right? High entropy, random bits. The more it structures itself to information rather than randomness, you know, the lower its entropy. So we have, an, we have an information system evolving towards states of lower entropy. And that requires, in a social system, consciousness becoming what? You see? So we have these logical steps. And if science gets behind it, if these little bubbles of enlightenment all over kind of coalesce and say, yea, verily, love is what we need, if we don't get lost in a, in a fight over my God's a you know, better programmer than your God, you know, then I can see that within, I don't know, you know, anywhere from 15 or 20 to 50 or 100, I have no idea. But Compared to the two million years that we've been trying to figure things out, you know, as a species, this, uh, you know, it's pretty short. It's, we're talking now maybe a century at most, possibility. Of course, the whole thing could de evolve, you know, and we may take another 2,500 years to get back up to where we are now. You know, it's hard to say. So I'm not really prognosticating anything happening, you know, immediately. It could take a very long time but at least it's now in reach. We actually are, the pieces are coming together that they actually could come together for a whole. Even 30 years ago, that wasn't possible. All the little things out in the, in the bush were all in the margins. Didn't know each other. Didn't like each other, right? My metaphors, not like your metaphor, right? So you're wrong and I'm right, you know, that kind of an attitude. Well, that's not the case anymore. Because now we can see each other up close and personal. We have more empathy. We have more understanding. And we have a bigger picture. So that's why I'm hopeful about it. Now, you don't see it yet, but it can turn pretty quickly. And by quickly, I don't mean in a week. I mean in a century. In, you know, three decades. Four decades. Who knows? could take another millennium. Uh, it's hard to say what we might do. We have free will. We can do some pretty stupid things sometimes. Uh, so that's why I say it. So it's, it's just that the potential is there. It's never really been there before because we've never really had metaphysics looking so much like science. So we believe in science. We think metaphysics is nonsense. But now we can derive science from metaphysics. Now we have a virtual reality that was created in other 
Well, there's metaphysics. Metaphysics becomes the superset, the other, right? We're the created subset. Metaphysics now is more important as a more fundamental place than this physical universe. See how that that sets a tone? And when the high priests get there, this is going to spread pretty quickly. So who knows? You know, we've got a couple of corners to turn first, but it's moving in that direction. Stirred up a horn's nest now. <laughs> We're going to have a lot of questions now. <laughs> Oops. Hello. Um, I have a question about um, consciousness and subconsciousness. Uh, is there anything like subconsciousness as, and how these two relate it? And the most important thing is, um, since I was little kids, you know, I always looking for answer to why am I here? And I've been through different paths, you know, different religions, different beliefs, until I become to where I am, you know, who I am right now. And to me, to become, to be aware of that stage of my mind, to be in, in that stage that I can, you know, practice to be to where you are right now. And I would like to know how I can um, get into this path strongly than you know because i get a lot of you know emotions and, and then go zigzag and go from here to this okay i have to practice this to become to bring my mind to that stage of consciousness then i'm gonna try this this method and this, and nothing helps you know anyway, but since i was a little kid i always looking for some answer and i truly believe in everything you said and you know in uh, but i want to be more aware to you know how might get to that stage of my conscious or even subconsciousness? Okay. okay. Uh, first, the question is about consciousness and subconsciousness. That's an interesting question. Um, as you heard me say in the film, the problem is fear. Right? And ego is a product of fear. Belief is, for the most part, a product of fear. So fear is the, is the problem. Now, our subconscious tends to be things that we don't really want to deal with, things that we push down out of sight, under the rug, you know, where we're in some kind of an event and suddenly we feel anger or something or we, you know, get upset and we say, well, that's not me. You know, that's coming up out of my subconscious, right? That's just these feelings and that's, I don't control those. That just happens. I get angry like that. Well, that's fear. That's basically where this fear is that you don't want to deal with, but you pushed away. We all have ways of dealing with fear. One of the main ones is denial. What do you have to fear? The reason I'm angry is because, you know, you're a jerk and you make me angry, you know? That's why I don't take responsibility for my own anger. I blame it on you. you see? So that's the way of we sidestep the fear that we have. If you take away all the fear, what you got left is love. So you don't have to have a technique to create love. You don't have to get rid of the fear. Well, if you take away all the fear, you also don't have a subconscious. You're particularly, you are aware of everything, of all aspects of you, of everything. The, the instincts, your basic things, uh, everything else. It's all, you're one whole integrated being without any mysterious dark parts. So all those dark parts are tied up with the fear. So when Freud was coming up with his nomenclature and he, you know, looked at a lot of people, he was an experimentalist, so he looked at a lot of people and he said, well, all these people have ego. That's their sense of self, their sense of I, who I am. Well, that turned out in his mind to be a very normal, healthy thing because everybody he saw that was normal and healthy had one. Well, everybody he saw that was normal and healthy was fear based had a lot of fear inside. That's normal. That's the way we all are, you see. So he looked at that and said, well, if it's normal, then it has to be good. It has to be healthy. Well, it's really dysfunctional. It's really not healthy at all. But it is normal. So that was the ego. And then he realized that some people, without actually having any benefit for themselves, were actually kind and nice to other people. He said, it doesn't happen often. But it happens every once in a while. So mostly there's this ego, but there is this capacity with some people to have this super ego. 
Well, that was the love part, right? What we need to be is all superego and no ego. But he didn't see it that way. He saw the superego then as the, as the nice part. And then what's left is the id. What's the id? Well, that's all that stuff in the dark that you don't know. These are your drives and your impulses and all the stuff that's in the subconscious that you don't control. You see? And that's where all the fear goes. So that's the, you know, that's kind of how that breaks out. And then your other question was, well, how do I get on the right path? How do I even find the right path? What is the right path? And is there a right path? Right? That's the, that's the thing. Well, there is no particular right path for you because you're an individual and you need to find, you need to create your own right path. When you follow somebody else's instruction, you know, you're a devotee of this group or that group or somebody that that's going to help you, that's not nearly as productive as if you do it your own way, your own tools, your own metaphors. And it boils down to something very easy to say, very hard to do, and that is growing up, becoming spiritual, becoming whole, becoming superego, getting rid of ego and fear, all you have to do is just to do the fear. All the rest of it just happens. It's simple. Just get rid of that fear. All right. Now, somebody might say, yeah, sounds simple, but how do you just get rid of that fear? Right? That's a part of me. Well, the way you get rid of it is not all at once. You have to work out a little bit at a time. First, you have to name it. Because remember, we deny that fear. So we're not going to be able to just reach down and say, oh, there, there's a fear, you know, and then pull it up by its roots and throw it away like pulling weeds out of a garden. It won't work that way. You have fears that you have no idea you have. When you come to the realization of all of your fears, you will realize that most of your life is led by those fears. Most of the decisions and choices you make are pushed and pulled by fear. We are full of it. It dominates us. Well, here's the way to find it. Look for a negative feeling. Do you ever feel anything as negative? Which could be something as simple as stress, upset, angry. Um, you, know, you know what I mean. Just everything that's negative in your life. Um, you know, people aren't treating you right. Uh, you know, you don't get the things you deserve, whatever. Anything that feels not good to you. If it's not happy, if it's not joy, then it's this negative stuff. Well, when you have that feeling, you know, you know, like, has anybody ever had a feeling like that that was negative? You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, right, that's the laugh, right? Has everybody had anything that wasn't like that, you know, is a, is a question to ask. But anyway, when you feel one of those things, that's ego, because it's an I. I'm upset, I'm angry, I hurt, I'm not being treated fair, you know, fairly. It's all about yourself. That's ego. Fear creates ego. So take that anger, that upset, that worry, and find out where is the fear that's creating that? Why do I get upset at this? And you'll trace it back, and if you're honest with yourself, you'll find a fear at the root of that ego. Ego is easy to find. We all have negative feelings. That's ego. Once you don't have any ego and fear, you don't have any negative feelings. Your life is full of joy. You live in a state of happiness. It's great. You see? So, you find the ego, trivial, we all have negative things, feelings all the time, trace it back to a fear. When you find the fear, then you have to have the courage to face it. You have to have the courage to own it and say, yes, I have that fear. That is my fear. It doesn't matter necessarily where it came from. You might want to work that angle, but that's not really the point. Own it. Then. Have the courage to be who you are. Be authentic. If you have that fear, don't push it under the, because nobody will like me if I act like that, so I act different. Well, the point is not acting different, but being different. See, that's the key. you got to be different. You've been acting different. Fear's hidden away. You act different, but you got to be different. And for that, you got to own the fear, accept it, and be a genuine, authentic person the way you are.
Now, if you don't like that person, say, oh, well, if I, you know, if I own that, I'm not a very nice person anymore. Well, if that's bad, and you really aren't a very nice person at that level, then change it. But you can't change it until you own it. You can't throw it away until it's yours. You see? And that's the thing that keeps everybody from getting there because they don't want to own it. They see it and they shy away from it. They see it, they make an excuse for it. They see it, they blame it on somebody else. They do everything but own it. So you own it. And then if you don't like it, you need to have the courage to let it go. And how you do that is that you'll start feeling that anger, say, is the problem. That anger swell up. You start to feel it. You go, ah, no, I know where that's coming from. That's this fear. I reject that. I'm not going to. I'm not going to feel that way. Just don't do it. Don't bury it. You're still accepting it. I'm not saying deny it. I'm saying you have to at first regulate it, and that'll be with your mind doing that. You have your intellect involved in it. But as you keep doing that, you'll find it easier and easier and easier to put aside. And longer and longer before it comes back. So you just keep working on that, just that one fear, until it's mostly gone. And now when that same situation happens that used to make you angry, anger's gone. There is no anger. Because the fear that triggered the ego that felt the anger isn't there anymore. Okay, that's your first one. Then you find the next one. Because you still have other negative feelings. So that's like now you're healed. It's just now you've done the hardest one you'll ever have to do, and that's the first one. The next one will be easier, and it'll go quicker. Find another fear, and keep doing that. And in anywhere from, you know, six months to six years, you'll be a totally different person. Because every time you offload one of those fears, it's like a pile of bricks just off your back. You know, it's it's so much lighter. Your life is so much better. And... That will make it easier for you to do the next one, which will make it easier for you to do the next one. And in, in time, you have it done. Then you will live in harmony. Things won't make you angry. You won't personalize everything. You know, it's not everything about you. You know, when it's all this ego, then everything anybody does is about, you know, is about you, right? Whatever anybody says, you find a way to take it personally. And then that makes you upset. So you realize it's not all about you. It's about them. They're expressing something that they feel. It really has very little to do with you. It's their feeling. They need to be responsible for their feeling. You need to be responsible for your feeling. So you take responsibility for yourself. If you're unhappy, realize that you're responsible for that. Don't blame it on somebody else. Take responsibility and do something about it. So that's the idea. So you don't need a, a guru to tell you the secret method. There is no secret method. All the secret methods boil down to the same thing. You get rid of the fear. And if you're not doing that, the methods are all right. Now there's lots of tools that people will tell you maybe how to do that. Tools are individual. Some tools may work well for you. Other tools just may leave you cold. Make up your own tools. So I'd say you really don't need too many tools, but just work with it. You'll generate tools as you go, you know, little things, things that help you deal with it. And that'll be based on your personality and all sorts of other things. You don't need any of those. So that's the, that's kind of the answer to that question. And I, I took a lot of time with that because of all the questions I get asked, that's the one that most everybody really wants to hear. So you ask like the million dollar question. That's that's what everybody you know, how do I how do I do better? How do I grow up? You know, how do I get in this state? I've been working on it for, you know, three decades and yeah, I've made a little progress, but it's mostly intellectual. I've got this big understanding of the world, but it's all in my head. I'm still the same person. I still get upset. I still get angry. I still feel put upon. I still, you know, have all this stuff. So that means you're not really growing up. You're just acting better. You're not being better. Well, acting better is very civilizing for the rest of us, but it doesn't really help you grow up. In. So that's the thing. And it starts with responsibility. If you're not living in a, in a world of joy, then you've got fear. And you need to get rid of it. It's just that easy and just that hard.
well, um, hi everyone, and thank you very much for being here. It, it's uh, really a joy uh, to hear you all, and the documentary was uh, really interesting. So, well, I don't have um, really a question. It's more like uh, I want to share um, something personal, and it's very related to what you, um, but related to the other question and what you have just um, talked about. And is that, um, um, well, I think I, everything you say, everything I hear uh, from, not only from you, but from other people and spiritual teachers, it comes very easily to my intellect. And I understand it almost right away. And a lot of things, um, probably not all, but a lot of things go through my mind and I get them very easily. Um, an example of that is in my work environment. Um, now I I try to skip the negative things from the co-workers when they uh, speak uh, about how our boss is, is wrong and they are right and that sort of thing. And now I am not part of the problem, um, probably not part of the solution either, but I don't play that game anymore. But um, on the other side, I feel that I have uh, to struggle a lot with other issues that I have and for example, insecurity. And asking this question took me a lot of effort for me to stand up and, and say it. But here I am um, trying to um, overcome that insecurity. And uh, you can probably have a, a comment uh, or a suggestion on this. Uh, and that's all what I wanted to say. Exactly, exactly the same thing that I, I said. Insecurity is one of those, those uh, manifestations of ego. And you will find that there is a fear creating that, or maybe several fears that are combining to create that insecurity. You just need to get in touch with yourself, with your inner self, and say, what's the fear? Why am I insecure? Why does it make me feel nervous to get up in front of people? Why does it make me feel nervous to speak my mind or to stand up and, and say the things I'd like to say? And you will find things like, well, if I do that, people won't like me, or I will be rejected, or, you know, there's some place there's a fear. The fear of rejection, the fear of not being liked, the fear of uh, people making fun of you, the fear of not having any friends, the, you know, and you can start pulling these things up, and then you'll categorize them, and you'll find some fundamental thing that is your fear. And that may take you six months just to find the fears. It's not an easy process. But when you find it, then you have to keep doing the things you just did. Stand up and talk anyway. That takes courage. That's the only antidote I know of to fear is courage. Nothing else will pull up a fear other than courage. So then you just have to say, well, if I get up in front or if I say the thing, I speak my mind, I do these things, I'll do it and see what happens. And if it works out good, I'll do it again. And I'll see if it works out badly, I'll try to understand why. Maybe speaking my mind wasn't appropriate at this time or at that place, you see? So maybe you get up and you speak your mind and you feel like, well, okay, I feel good that I said that. And then you may get a very negative answer. But you have to think, well, why? Maybe it was the wrong thing to say to the wrong people at the wrong time. And maybe I just wasn't too sensitive, you know, to other people. And maybe I shouldn't have really said it that way. And actually, that really was all about me because I'm the one who felt I needed to say it. And instead of it being about you that you need to say it, you have to think, if I say this, is it going to be helpful? Is it going to be useful? And people take that and do something positive with it. And if the answer is no, well, then keep it to yourself. You see, if it's not going to help anybody, then there's no point in saying it. And then you think, well, what could have I said that was different that would have helped them? Instead of saying, you know, you're a bunch of idiots, you're doing it wrong. That's not going to help anybody, even if that's the truth. It's not going to help anybody. You have to start where they are, see the world from where they are, and then Give them some information that helps them choose maybe a different path. You see? So it's not always just speaking your mind. It's it's trying to interact with the world in a way that lowers the entropy of everybody. And in so doing, you'll lower your own entropy. You'll get the fear will go away and you won't have that insecurity. You'll feel 
full of, of confidence because you'll know who you are and you'll be authentic and you won't be afraid to express that authentically. And you'll just get better and better at interacting with people in a way that helps lower the entropy for everybody. Your point isn't to just tell people how they're wrong and what they should be doing. That's more ego. You need to tell people and say things that those people can use to help them lower their entropy. See? So it's that bigger picture that you need. But work at it. Find the fear. Have the courage to stand up and be yourself. And then modify yourself as you have the need. As you learn. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. That's the courage part. The courage part is the don't be afraid to make mistakes. Don't be afraid of what's going to happen. Do it. Then take what happens and say, how could I have done it better? How could I be better? How could I have seen this in a better light that would have had a better result? And try that. And then modify that. And then try the next thing. A year later, you're a different person. It takes courage to do that. Because what you're doing is changing yourself at the being level. you got an intellectual level, you got a being level. All real growth has to be at the being level. Change who you are, not how you see yourself. So it has to be real. You can't just be intellectual. There's very little gain in just being an intellectual. See a bigger picture. No, no. You see the bigger pictures in your intellect, but it doesn't really help you at that being level. It's two different things. You need to get that. You need to get that same understanding at your being level that you have at your intellectual level. That's the that would be the key. Hello. Um, just adding on to that, one of the things I've heard is that the job of fear is to call more fear to it. And when we think about the movie and virtual reality, if there's some kind, sometimes there's there, there possibility of a like a matrix of fear that there's systems that. And I think the movie kind of hit on that a little bit when they were talking about having more stuff. Why do we want more stuff? And also just news, you know, news just pushes the idea of being afraid of people around. So kind of this time now is a time of lifting and, and so my question, and I'm curious to know from the two of you, your definition of love. And, and what that is. Okay. Uh, I can start with that. There's a, several ways that I can define love. I can describe it and I can define it. Love is the nature of a low entropy consciousness. Okay. Now that's kind of tech and speak, right? Uh, that, that, that leaves a lot of people kind of cold. But, in a, you know, that's the kind of the, the theory, right? Love is the nature of a low entropy consciousness. So that means when you get rid of all your fear, it's left as love. You don't have to make love. Well, you might want to make love, but you don't have to create love. You become love once you get rid of the fear. It's the fear that is the, that is the problem. Okay. So another way to define love is that love is about other, not about self. So as you think about the things you're doing and why you do them, you have to ask the question, is this about me, what I want, what I need, what I know is right, what I know everybody else should do? You know, is it about you? Or are you trying to help somebody else learn, grow? You're trying to be what somebody else needs. You're trying to uh, give rather than take. You see, that's love. That's how you can tell. Now, that can be tricky. You know, you might, you know, you might say, uh, well, I, I know, you know, I know I'm right. And I know this is the way things need to be, and you just need to, you know, do it my way because I care about you, and it's because I care about you that I'm going to force you to do things my way because my way is better, and you just don't know. You see, people get into that sort of thing, and they're saying, well, it's not about me. I'm just doing it for their own good. But no, that is about you. It's about your control. It's about you knowing more than anybody else, you see. 
It's all about you. So you have to be careful that you don't trick yourself into, you know, what is it about me or about others? That's, so that would be two things. Love is always about other. It only takes one to love. Doesn't take two. Just one. So, it's a thing that you give. Love is always given away. You have to earn trust. But you give away love. So, that's, but I like the definition. It's the, it's the nature of a low entropy consciousness. <laughs> yeah, that's my favorite. What's your name? Heather. Heather, nice to meet you. Love is a lot of things. How many people do we have on the planet? Seven and a half billion. That's about how many perspectives you can have, right? Love is an experience, part of a relationship. Every time I look at my wife, whether it's joy, fear, heaven, hell that we go through, there's always love. It's the quality of relationship for me. It's a higher form of uh, expression, the angels of our better nature, so to speak. From the universal, higher perspective, perhaps it's an impersonal, but for lo as long as I'm in this body, sharing my consciousness between personal, impersonal, ego, understanding, from various levels of consciousness, various perspectives I may have, all of that can be love for me. It's really about the quality of relationship. It's an expression of relationship. That's about as much as I can really say for you. So whatever your perspective of love is, that too is love. Um, whatever your perspective of love is, that too is love. Is it the opposite of fear? Perhaps. That too is love. It's an understanding. Pursuant to the questions that were asked about what we're seeing in the world and all the tension that we're all experiencing, when we look at the news media or the internet and our hearts are broken or anger comes up due to egoic structures and belief systems what can conquer all of that for thousands of years it's been told is love but we seem to be having a struggle with that don't we because there's seven and a half billion of us currently trying to express what this truly means and understand the quality of relationship and we all have these different ideas so while i may not be able to define love for you I would really like to encourage the concept of compassion, which is slightly different because it comes from the Latin root compati, which means to suffer with. When you are in touch with your own suffering, pursuant to what you're asking about the subconscious, the things that absorb into our holistic psyche, when you are able to come in terms with that, come to terms with that, through the energy of, I failed here, I, I let this go, I made this mistake, and it's okay because I can do better. When you can get in touch with that with yourself because you know that you have suffered, you can extend that to other people because you see the suffering in other people's eyes. And when you see it on the internet, whether it be people being shot by police officers for no apparent reason, or one segment of Islam sh killing another segment of Islam, or killing Americans in the name of Islam, we get to a point where we start to say one of two possibilities exists. One is that we can become numb to it, or we can try to love over it, even though we feel numb or we feel hurt or we feel hatred. But if you can get in touch with your own compassion, because you too have suffered, you, do, you understand what that truly means, 
that's a pretty decent expression that I think can heal a lot of this problem rather than try to impose my thoughts of love on someone else. Does that make sense to you? It's enough. I have two quick questions, maybe for you, April, whoever can answer them. Um, I One of the things I so appreciated about this movie was the different perspectives, hearing from all the different perspectives. And I was wondering when you, I loved how you did kind of the time warp and fast forwarded from 2008 to 2015. Did you make any attempt to uh, circle back around and include any of the women in your interviews that you finished up with in the fall? And um, I'm just curious. And, um, and the other thing that was so powerful for me in this was the nature energy. And I've never been to the Monroe Institute, and I'm just wondering, were we, were we looking at the grounds? Were we, and, you know, if you could talk a bit about the setting, that would be great. Yeah, the uh, the women. Let's start with there. Uh, they weren't. We didn't go back to them because actually, when we were putting it together, we didn't know if they were going to be in it. Uh, if you watch Beyond the Physical, they weren't in it at all, and so we thought we were going to just continue Beyond the Physical. But we actually liked what they said, and it's kind of a good contrast to, or not contrast, but yeah. Compliment, yeah, that's it. So, yeah, we figured we'd take what they said, and if we revisited everybody, the movie would probably be like three hours long or so, but, um, yeah. Um, yeah, and about the women, we got a lot of slack that none of the women were in the second film, by the way. It was mentioned, like... We had a Nancy at the end, yeah, but in Beyond the Physical, it's like, what happened to all the women? What about the women? But, you know, we kind of saying, too, it's not even about if it's male or female reporting, it's the information that comes out, you know? So because the men that we followed with um, Skip and Paul and Tom um, were in Beyond the Physical, we wanted to see how did they evolve with this third film. So how did they change? Did they not change? Did they still have the same views and, and so forth? And, um, with the nature, a lot of the pictures that you saw, we did film ourselves. Some of it was stock footage, but the grounds, when you did the time warp there, when we had the drone, we went to the, to TMI, that's the grounds of TMI. That big crystal that we used, we shot there on the grounds as well. Um, when Skip was talking in the second part, we were there interviewing him at the Monroe Institute, and same thing with <coughs> Nancy McMonagall. Uh, those were the grounds there. And we were sitting in the kitchen, actually, of uh, it was Bob Monroe's kitchen there. Um, so, yes, a lot of the footage was did come from there. Okay, so uh, the last beach that Paul was on is Fernandino. Am I pronouncing that right? Fernandina? Fernandina Beach in Florida. Yes. And then when Carol was speaking and there were big waves of the ocean and stuff, um, I don't know, but I heard you say, that's Hawaii, and that's something else. So that was stock footage. That wasn't the actual ocean that we went to. But anything that you saw of Paul, we shot on location. So, sure. One more, one more question, and then we'll be wrapping up. I just wanted to say I really appreciated your response regarding to the question about the conscious and the subconscious, and <clears throat> you mentioned it involves um, you know, getting to love and overcoming fear, and there may be tools involved in that. And I just wanted to get your perspective a little bit on what some of those tools might be, um, whether it's meditation or energy healing, um, prayer, um, being out in nature, things, because it's easier said than done. So just your perspective on some of the tools. All of those tools you mentioned, yes. They're, <laughs> they're all... Do you find some, do you do that as part yeah. of your daily practice? Well, you, know, you started with meditation, and that would be a good frame of mind for you to help find that fear in. Because when you're in a meditation state, you are more open to what's really deep inside of you than you are otherwise. So a meditation state would be a great tool for helping you find that fear, you see. Um, 
It would also be a good state to help you uh, understand how you should interact with people so that the net result is the lowering of entropy all around. You know, how do I present? How do I, what do I say and what do I keep to myself sort of thing? Wanting to be helpful uh, rather than just instructive. Okay. Okay. So meditation is a good tool. But yes, being out in nature, uh, it's just sitting quietly. Meditation doesn't have to be formal. Uh, sometimes people will, uh, you know, use their intellect to catch them expressing fear and then stop themselves from going forward. Other people will just go ahead and go forward and be whoever they are and then analyze it later. So that would be two different ways of, of dealing with that. It just depends on your personality. That's mm -hmm. why I say you make up your own tools. Okay. Sometimes a walk in a, in a, in an old, forest is just really cleansing mm -hmm. to some people. Other people, it's just a walk in you know, a bunch of old trees. They just don't get that much out of it. So that's why I say it's better to make up your own, to whatever works for you. Try what, try everything <clears throat> and use, use what works. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And if you want an actual tool, Mark has the Triad Mind. You can get a subscription, a monthly subscription, to some of his meditation tools. So maybe you should kind of mention that. Yes, go to triadmind.com and sign up. <laughs> There's some 60 recordings up there uh, for varying levels of interest in meditation. If you're kind of entry level, you go to level one and teach you about relaxation. Uh, it's mostly for folks who are uh, prescribed by their doctors that meditation might be a good idea for you. Your hypertension, you know, you're a little too wound tight. Uh, you can't sleep. Level two has more to do with the spiritual applications. And level three is about the uh, program self-actualization. So you get to explore consciousness on three levels, the subconscious being one. What you're actually doing is bringing the conscious mind to the stage three, four level of sleep, where a lot of self-conscious or hypnagogic imagery can arise. I don't uh, really consider myself much of a teacher, but a facilitator of experience. So the experiences that you have will be uniquely your own, um, which I think is the highest form of your ability to, you know, um, grow. Um, you also get the opportunity to get in touch with the super conscious mind. We could talk about that for a long time, but basically, that is uh, it, that can be expressed simply as the divine within or a higher consciousness. Uh, there, there are so many different metaphors, as Tom said, to express these ideas, but it's, it's certainly a transcendent state above the ego state. So, so all of those exist. I have some cards. If you all are interested, you're more than welcome to uh, grab one, and I'll have a coupon for you as well. Thanks for the shameless plug. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank you for a great podcast. If you'd like more information about our films or to purchase our DVDs, you can head on over to our website at thepastseries.com. They're also available to purchase on Amazon.com. Our films are also streaming online at Vimeo.com, GuyMTV.com, and iTunes. If you have a show suggestion or would like us to interview someone specifically, please feel free to shoot us an email at info at thepastseries.com or send us a tweet at the past series. Please rate and review us in iTunes and subscribe. We hope you enjoyed the show.